Good afternoon, everyone. This is Gordon Dixon with the Associated General uh, Contractors and Curtis uh, Childress with uh, Forlin and Robertson, who's going to be uh, talking here in just a few minutes. We, we are going to uh, record this, so if you have some, uh, want to watch this later on, we can. We're going to wait a few more minutes because we have a lot of people who are interested in this uh, presentation uh, and some updated information we want to provide you, so we'll get started here in just a few moments. And while we're waiting to start, if the machinery is not working correctly, we're going to blame that on Golden. Can certainly do that. I I, I love to have have the blame on such things. Uh, it, it's a great comment for uh, Curtis to kind of start it off with. Uh, just some logistics on this as, as we're beginning. If, uh, we will take uh, questions at the end of this, this webinar today. Uh, you can simply, uh, there should be a, a, an icon down the bottom for Q&A. You can just simply click on that, type in your question, uh, and, and the question we'll put in a queue, and we'll, we'll read those questions at the end today, and then, and then go forward from there. So we'll, we'll get started here in just a moment. And our title might be a little bit misleading because it says OSHA's final rule on occupational exposure. And I don't think we've really got a final rule because this seems to keep <laughs> changing as we... Uh, that's, a, that's a great point, Curtis. Uh, there seems to be an evolving uh, um, uh, comments on this and we're going to provide you a little update that we received from uh, the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, uh, as soon as, as we're going along here. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here later on. Folks, I don't want to hold people up, so it is 3 o'clock, it is our starting hour, so we're going to uh, get rolling on this, this webinar today. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today I have uh, Curtis Childress with uh, Forlane and Robertson here to talk to you all about the uh, expanding and, and changing rules on uh, SOCA compliance. Uh, as you all know that this issue uh, has come up for, for a number of years and uh, OSHA has implemented a, a start date, uh, an, an enforced, uh, a start date of June 23. Uh, Virginia has said they're going to enforce uh, this issue on June 23 as opposed to the rest of, of, of OSHA who says they're going to push it back until September. Uh, and then we got a, a rule today basically from, from the, uh, the Department of Labor and Industry that's basically saying that uh, they are not going to have an, an, an effective uh, compliance um, or an inspection process on this. But if, if both people see any significant issues or if these receive complaints, that they're going to uh, enforce those regulations going forward. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to have Curtis uh, talk to you all at this point and go forward from there. Thank you, sir. If you're like me, you started early today and you've already had a long day. I don't know how to make this entertaining and I don't know how to make it fun uh, because I don't have beer and barbecue. But we'll see if we can uh, help communicate some information and make this uh, perhaps a little bit more understandable. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, if you all, um, I got a note that you're all seeing a black screen. So we're trying to make sure that we've got this uh, corrected on here as, as we're going along. I um, want to make sure that you all can see that. There's Curtis, there's myself. So we want to make sure that we've got this correctly set up. Hopefully you all can see that and uh, we'll go forward from there. Curtis, take it away. Thanks, sir. Okay, a couple of important things at the start. As we go through the federal OSHA, they've announced that they're gonna delay the enforcement of this until 23 September. However, for those of us here in the Commonwealth, we're under VOSH. And VOSH has stated <clears throat> that enforcement can begin on 23 June, 2017. For those of you without a calendar in front of you, that's Friday of next week. Now, what VOSH has stated is that they will not be conducting planned construction inspections directed at, at exposure to silica. However, if you are doing what I refer to as being stupid in public, VOSH will respond to those complaints. If they have a complaint from an employee about silica, 
if they're out conducting an inspection and you've got a worker that can't be seen because they're in the middle of a cloud of silica dust, yes, they will begin enforcing it. This is a plain view doctrine. So while there is some slack in here, don't count on that. If we're in violation of the standard, we're in violation of the standard. Now, my personal take on this, and this is purely Uncle Kurt's personal, quit focusing on the timetables. If you don't feel comfortable that you're already in compliance with the standard, you need to start documenting your efforts to get in compliance and start that documentation today. There is help available out there. There's going to be some more help available. One of the notes that cropped up today, <clears throat> the Virginia Department of Labor and Industry is going to be adding a section on their website that deals specifically with silica. One of the very valuable resources in there will be a PowerPoint that you can use for training of your personnel. And there's even a uh, training certificate in there that you can use to document that you have conducted training. So there is help that's coming. Now, let's start at the start. What the heck is silica? And what is this stuff? And where does it come from? And why is it a problem? Well, very simply, it's a naturally occurring mineral. About 10% of the crust of the earth is silica. And you're going to find it in glass. You're going to find it in most sand. You're going to find it in a lot of rock. It's going to vary depending upon the strata of rock that you're dealing with. If you're dealing with rock that came out of the quarries in Berryville, Virginia, probably not because you're in dolomitic limestone. But if you're dealing with a quarry in the greater Richmond area, you're in granite. That's anywhere from 16 to 26% silica. You're going to have it there. And there are going to be other things that does have silica. The standard addresses respirable crystalline silica. If you're talking about silicone rubber, no, that's not crystalline silica. It has to be in such a condition that you can inhale it and take it into your body. If I handed you a five pound chunk of silica, you really can't hurt yourself except by dropping it on your foot. What do we mean by respirable? We're talking baby powder fine particles, specifically about one to five microns in size. And a human hair is about 50 microns wide. So we are talking a really fine powder here. Bigger than that, it's too big to take into your body. Smaller than that, well, you take it in, but it comes back out again. Unfortunately, we take that five pound chunk of silica and we do things to turn it into that baby powder fine dust that we're talking about here. That's going to be our problem is the respirable portion of the silica. Let's define some terms that are used in that standard. One of those is PEL. That's the permitted exposure limit. It's how much of this can you be exposed to over how long a period of time. The PEL is based in terms of an eight hour time weighted average. So if you had a high exposure for 10 minutes, then no exposure the rest of the day. Your time weighted exposure is gonna be lower. The exposure is given in terms of micrograms. Uh, for those of you that are not accustomed to working in the uh, metric system, a microgram is one millionth of a gram. Most of the things we work with are in milligrams. That's a thousandth of a gram. So we're talking about a tiny little thing here. An aspirin tablet weighs about 325 milligrams. What we're talking about here is an amount of silica equal to an aspirin tablet in a lifetime of work exposure. One of the more common things that we get into with silica is concrete and mortar. Concrete is a mix of Portland cement, coarse aggregate, fine aggregate in the water, and admixture chemicals. The percentage of silica that's in there is gonna be driven by the percent of silica that's in the aggregates that went to make up that concrete. For instance, fine aggregates commonly called sand. If we're talking about sand that came somewhere out of the uh, uh, sand pits around Petersburg, Virginia, that's gonna be silica dioxide. It's going to be high in silica. But if you've got a manufactured sand that was made from basalt rock that doesn't have silica, you won't have it. What's the easy way to tell whether you've got silica 
in a material or product, go to the safety data sheet. The suppliers need to provide you with the safety data sheet. And that safety data sheet should give you information on silica that's going to be present in that product. Now OSHA published their final rule, and I use the term final very loosely, on March 25th, 2016. And this is where we really got the notice that there are things that we're gonna have to do. Things have been changing somewhat since that final rule was published. But the things that have really changed on this have been some variation and pushback on dates. We haven't had really that much of a change in the standard. The reasons for the rule? Well, the previous PELs that were out there used formulas that were really hard to understand. The standards for construction and shipyard were quite different from that for other industries and it required on using particle counts instead of a standard laboratory analysis. The general industry formula is equal to about 100 micrograms and the construction limits were 250 micrograms. So we had total difference there. The most important reason for the rule, the limits were too high. Exposure to respirable crystalline silica has been linked to silicosis, lung cancer, COPD, and kidney disease. And for those of you that wonder, how do you get kidney disease from silica? When it messes up your lungs, it puts stress on other systems within your body. Your kidneys are trying to build up, uh, deal with a buildup of fluid around your heart and your lungs, and they wind up failing. There's also a lot of epidemiological evidence that the exposure levels we have are way too high that they're not protecting workers. The most important reason for the rule is this. That's the guy that comes to work for us in the morning. We can't do things to him that's gonna keep him from enjoying his life and going home. And we're hurting people. And we still haven't learned this is not a new event. Many of you have heard of the Hawk's Nest Tunnel over in West Virginia. This was a tunnel that was built back in the 1930s to carry water for hydroelectric power project. The rock in that tunnel was extremely high silica. As you can see from the picture, there was no effective ventilation. There was no personal protective equipment and there were no controls on the drilling operation. Nearly every employee that worked on that project has died from silicosis. <clears throat> and we're still doing some things today that make about as much sense. The health benefits, OSHA has indicated that more than 600 deaths a year would be prevented by the new standard. 124 lung cancer, 325 silicosis, 193 end-stage kidney disease and preventing more than 900 new silicosis cases each year. For those of you that are not familiar with silicosis, there's no cure for it. There's very limited treatment and it destroys your ability to breathe. The standard covers the three forms of crystalline silica. Those are quartz, cristobalite, and tritomite. Doesn't matter what type it is, it's still addressing it. The exposures that we're likely to have are chipping, cutting, sawing, drilling, grinding, sanding, or crushing concrete, brick, block, rock, stone that has silica in it. We're also gonna have exposure from using certain sand-based products. For instance, foundries use sand as a casting medium. If you're in the glass industry and you're doing finishing, polishing of glass, it's going to produce silica dust. That solid sheet of glass is not going to hurt you, but the dust from it can. Sand blasting using abrasive uh, silica sand is incredibly bad. The reason for that is when the grains of sand strike a hard surface, they shatter. What you're inhaling has nice, fresh, jagged edges. They're not weathered or worn down at all. The industries that OSHA has listed, 
that have exposures, construction, glass making, pottery making, the list goes on and on, but a couple of things for you to notice. Concrete products, ready mix concrete, asphalt products, landscaping. So if any of you work in, let's say a paving industry that uses a coal planer to go over and mill an existing highway, you've got an exposure to silica. If you're in the transit mixed concrete business, some of your operations are gonna fall under general industry, some are gonna fall under construction. Doesn't matter, the new standard addresses both. Who is OSHA focusing on? <clears throat> OSHA's indicated 2.3 million workers, but please note, two million of those are construction workers. They're looking at 676,000 businesses 600,000 of them are those of us in construction. There are two standards that are being published. <clears throat> One standard is for general industry and the maritime industry. The other standards for construction. And this is not any different from what we've had in other standards, the 1910 general industry and the 1926. However, our exposure levels are gonna be the same. Complying with the standard, well, here's where things start to get a little confusing and it shouldn't be. This is actually pretty straightforward if you can read through. When you read, <clears throat> when you read the OSHA rule, there's a table one that's listed there. Table one, <clears throat> excuse me, has some very helpful information and it lists controls <clears throat> for different operations that we do. And you can use those controls or you can go out and measure your actual exposures and decide on your best control measures. But either way you do this, you're gonna have to have a written exposure control plan. We are gonna spend some time talking about the details in that. But briefly, first of all, you need to list what the task that your workers will do and what methods you're gonna to use to control their exposures. You're gonna to need to designate a competent person. You're going to need to look at restricting housekeeping methods that can make your exposures worse. You will need to offer medical exams to workers that have to wear a respirator more than 30 days a year. Let's look at that for just a moment. If you have to do that, you're going to incur an expense of probably around $900 per worker. You're also gonna be involved in medical record keeping. So think real hard if you wanna go that route. You need to train workers. You need to train them on the hazards and the controls that they use. And as I mentioned, one of the good pieces of news is that keep an eye on the Department of Labor website. There's training material that they're rolling out for us to use now. You will also need to maintain records of exposures and records of medical exams. Let's talk about that one just a little bit. Some of you already have to maintain medical records for workers. The OSHA standards require that you maintain those records for as long as a person works for you, plus 30 years. So Gordon, <laughs> you, you, we've just given you your 20 year watch and it's, it's been good. And I, I need to keep your records from 20 years ago for another 30 years. There is an alternative to that you are permitted to give the worker their records to take with them. So think about how you wanna handle your records of exposures and your records of medical exams. Now, the PEL, which is the enforcement level, is 50 micrograms as an eight hour time weighted average. And here's where it can get dicey. That assumes that we all work eight hours. But there are times, as you well know in construction, that an eight hour day is a vague memory. 
Today may be the day that we're working 12 hours. You can't simply take that number and divide it by eight and multiply by 12. Permitted exposure drops off significantly. The other number is your action level, 25 micrograms as an eight hour DWA. What's the difference between the two? PEL is where you're going to be written up for violating it. Action level is the point that you need to begin taking some action to address your workers' exposures. 25 micrograms also is the lower limit of detection for silica. If you can detect it, you have reached the action level. An exposure assessment is required if exposures are could reasonably be expected to be above the action level. Exposure assessments can be done uh, following a performance option or a scheduled monitoring option. A performance option, exposures are assessed using any combination of air monitoring data or objective data. Objective data includes air monitoring data from industry-wide surveys. So we may have the American Concrete Institute that has determined when conducting this operation, here is the exposure that you can anticipate. It demonstrates an employee exposure associated with a particular product or material or specific process, task, or activity. And we, have to, we do have to be realistic in what we're doing. This has to reflect workplace conditions that closely resemble what you're doing. We cannot take a sample that was taken running a saw outdoors in the open air and say, my worker who's inside of an enclosed building has the same exposure from the same process. Schedule monitoring. You prescribed a schedule for making initial and periodic personal monitoring. If personal monitoring indicates that you're below the action level, you don't need any additional monitoring. If the most recent is at or above the action level, do it again within six months. If the most recent is above the permitted exposure level, you need to do this again within three months. When you've got two consecutive non-initials and they're below the action level, you can stop monitoring. But if your circumstances change, you want to reassess this. Appendix A goes into the methods of the sample being analyzed. Here's the important part. The samples have to be taken correctly. For instance, when you're doing personal monitoring, I can't simply hang a pump and a filter cassette on the worker. The standard is for respirable silica. There's a small device called a cyclone that goes between the pump hose and the filter cassette. It takes out pieces of silica that are too big for a worker to inhale. I need to send this to an accredited laboratory. And the sample analysis can use OSHA, NIOSH, or the MSHA methods. It doesn't matter. They're all accepted levels. But it needs to be an accredited lab that is following specified uh, QAQC procedures. General industry and maritime does speak of regulated areas. And there are some of you listening to me that do fall under general industry. If you're in, let's say, the uh, transit mixed concrete business, the parts of your operation around the yard are going to fall under general industry. Those regulated areas are going to be required where exposures could reasonably be expected to exceed the PEL. You're going to have to mark and designate these in any way that limits workers going into that area. You're going to need to have warning signs at the entrances to those areas. And beyond that point, you're going to need a respirator. The hierarchy of controls, you're allowed to use any engineering or work practice controls to limit exposures to the PEL. For instance, our company does core drilling of concrete using a diamond bit. Our engineering controls on that are quite simple. I've got a $900 bit. I want water on the bit. And with a wet bit, I'm not putting a respirable dust into the air. 
you can also use work practice controls. And that may limit how long an individual employee performs this operation each day. Respirators are permitted where the PEL cannot be achieved with engineering and work practice controls. But please note, we're not allowed simply to throw a respirator on the worker and wash our hands of it. We get the exposure as low as we can, and then we go to the, using personal protective equipment. Some of the engineering controls that are out there, well, here you see a worker that's grinding on stone and there's no engineering controls. He's sort of got some personal protective equipment. I think that's a bandana he's got wrapped across his face here. Well, it looks like it. But the worker on the right is using water and he's not putting a respirable dust into the air. Here we've got a worker that's grinding on concrete with no engineering controls. Without doing any sampling at all, I can tell you that worker is going to exceed the PEL because if I can't see the worker, he's over the limit. The worker on the other side is using a vacuum and a dust collector at the point that he's creating the dust. He's gonna pull most of that out of the air and it is an effective control. How about running a jackhammer, breaking old concrete? They do make a dust suppression system that's a water spray. Is this going to be the end all solution for everything? Unfortunately not. Can you imagine what it's like using a water spray outdoors in Virginia in January? I'm going to have a problem with my system freezing up. I'm going to have a problem with ice on the ground. But where we can use it, we need to. And there are systems out there. Respiratory protection. Again, we can't simply throw a respirator at the worker and say, here you go. It's spelled out under 29 CFR 1910-134. Respirators are going to be required for exposures that are above your um, permitted exposure level when you're implementing controls for tasks where the controls are not going to be feasible, where feasible controls can lower my exposure, but I still can't get it below the limit, or while you're inside of a regulated area under general industry. Housekeeping. We do run into a problem with housekeeping. How are we going to clean up what's laying on the ground? While it's laying on the ground, unless I'm laying down there trying to snort it, this is not a respirable dust. But we do things that take that plain old benign dust laying there and we stir it up and now it becomes respirable. If it's going to contribute to your exposure, you don't allow <clears throat> dry sweeping or brushing. You don't allow the use of compressed air for cleaning a surface or cleaning clothing unless you're using it with a ventilation system to capture that dust. Case in point, spray on fireproofing. At one time, it was made with a wonderful material called asbestos, and they stopped doing that. Much of the spray on fireproofing now contains silica. It comes in the form of dry material that we mix with water and we spray on. Well, it's going on kind of as a slurry. It's not really producing a dust. That's not respirable. But the stuff that wound up lying all on the floor slab, when it dries, we're going to sweep it up. If we do this by dry sweeping it without any sweeping compound, we're going to be creating respirable silica. If you don't have any other method, like a HEPA vacuum or wet sweeping or ventilation with compressed air. You can use that, but that's, can you demonstrate that's your last resort? <clears throat> Medical surveillance is spelled out in the general industry maritime section. Employers have to offer medical exams to workers who will be exposed above the action level for 30 or more days a year. Employers must offer exams every three years to workers who continue to be exposed above the trigger level. 
Exam includes medical and work history, the physical exam, chest x-ray, pulmonary function test, and on the first exam, a TB test. Gordon, why are they doing TB tests? I don't know, why? Because if you've had tuberculosis, your lungs are already damaged. And I can't expose you to the same level of silica that I would expose a worker to that's got good lungs. Uh, a couple of notes on medical opinion, because we do get into things here that deal with HIPAA. Uh, I get these now on my staff that work with asbestos and lead and isobutyl bad stuff. The report that I get is different from the report that my worker gets. The worker gets a detailed report with detailed medical findings, any work restrictions, and any recommendations on further evaluation or treatment. What I get is an opinion from the doctor that describes limitations on whether they can use a respirator, what kind of respirator, and whether or not the worker can safely perform this type of work. If the worker consents, I may have recommendations on limits on exposure to respirable silica or send this person to a specialist. In a nutshell, the worker gets the whole thing. I get a medical opinion that says, can safely work, cannot safely work. And that limits personal medical information that I'm holding on to as an employer. And I'm a lot more comfortable with that. This also is going to trigger some things under the hazard communication standard. Our old friend that talks about safety data sheets. Silica is a cancer causing agent. It has an impact on lungs, the immune system, and kidneys. If your workers have an exposure to silica, have you trained them on what the health hazards are, what tasks are gonna expose them to silica, what the protections are, what are the medical surveillance things? Can you document that you've done this as part of your hazard communication program? Do you have safety data sheets on the materials that contain crystal and silica? Employers are required to comply with the HASCOM standard. And record keeping. Again, this is what we're talking about with air monitoring data, objective data, and or medical records. The construction standard, if you go through the whole standard, is broken out something like this. There's the scope, who does it apply to, definitions, and the real heart of this, <clears throat> the specified exposure control methods or your alternative control methods. The PEL, exposure assessment, and how are you gonna comply with this? It also has a section that talks about respiratory protection, housekeeping, and the written exposure control plan, medical surveillance, and communication of the silica hazards, and record keeping. All occupational exposures to respirable crystal and silica are covered unless the employee exposure will stay below 25 micrograms as an eight hour time weighted average under any foreseeable condition. If you're not going to hit that trigger level, we're okay. Table one is a very handy tool for you to use because it takes a number of the common tasks that we have and says, if you do this, you're okay. Employers that fully and properly implement the controls that are listed on table one do not have to comply with the PEL. They don't have to conduct exposure assessments for employees that are doing those things. And here's an example of what a table one entry might look like. One of the very common things we get into is using a stationary masonry saw. I've got a brick saw or a block saw. <clears throat> if my saw is equipped with a built-in water delivery system that's continually feeding water to the blade when it operates, and you'll see if I'm doing this for less than four hours or more than four hours, I am not required to have any specific respiratory protection. 
if I've got water on the saw blade, I'm good. But you do need to operate and maintain that tool in accordance with the maker's instructions. We also use handheld power saws. This is like a quickie or a K2. It's a two cycle engine, it's got an abrasive blade. Well, I'm using a saw and it's got a water system that's continually putting water on my blade. Okay. And I'm doing this out of doors and I'm doing it less than four hours per shift. I don't need anything. But if I'm doing it more than four hours, I need to have an APF of 10 respirator. If I'm using one indoors, I'm going to need APF 10. The water will help reduce it, but it doesn't eliminate it. Now, a note about APF. It stands for Applied Protection Factor. Different respirators have different protection levels. If you're wearing a half-face respirator, that has an APF of 10. If you're using a full-face respirator, like the one in the picture, that's got an APF of 50. If you're using a powered air purifying respirator with a full face piece, that's got an APF of 1,000. And if you do anything that you have to wear an SCBA, if it's set for pressure demand, that's got a protection factor of 10,000. But please note, if you're looking at using a dust mask, APF is zero. If it is not marked on that respirator, it indicates that it meets NIOSH standards, it's not a respirator. There are disposable respirators, but look at them closely. You'll see a marking on there that says NIOSH, and it will list a rating such as N95. That is a respirator. That has a protection factor of 10. But if it's a dust mask, there is no protection factor. Here are the various things that are listed on table one. I'll quit talking for a minute. <clears throat> I'll let you walk through and pick out what you do. Let's take a look at the top right hand column. Handheld grinders for mortar removal, tuck pointing. Has an incredibly high level of exposure to silica. A handheld power saw. We've been talking about mortar and concrete. Are any of you uh, dealing with hardy plank type siding material? That is a silica containing product. Hardy planks are actually set up to be cut by scoring it and snapping it. If I'm planning on using a handheld saw, <clears throat> to cut cement board, that silica. If you're drilling concrete, you're jackhammering concrete. If you've got a crusher, if you're cutting brick, it's in there. There's some good material there that will be of good help to you in figuring what protection do I need. Fully and properly implementing control spec on table one. Folks, just to say, well, you know, I got controls on that saw, we're done. No, it's not. Employers are required to ensure that the controls are present and that they're being maintained. And the employees understand the proper use of controls and that they are using them. I can't simply, well, you know, I put a water spray on that jackhammer, you know. He's not using it. I can't do nothing about that. Here's employer. You are required to do something about that. Now, table one speaks of employees that are engaged in the task. Employees are engaged in the task when they're operating that listed piece of equipment, or they're helping with the task, or they have some responsibility for completing the task. For instance, I bring brick to the kid running the brick saw, and I carry the cut brick away. I'm not operating the brick saw. Do you think I'm engaged in the task? Yes. Yeah, because I'm there assisting with it. 
I'm not engaged in the task if I just happen to be somewhere in that neighborhood. Respiratory protection requirements. They are required where exposures are above the PEL and are likely to stay above the PPL despite full and proper implement implementation of those controls. And if respirators are required, they must be used by all employees engaged in the task for the entire duration of the task. Well, it, it says I only need this for half a day, so I'll just wear it a half a day, then I'll take it off. You're gonna need it the whole day. Provisions specify how to determine when respirators are required for an employee that performs more than one task, because I'm doing task A in the morning and task B in the afternoon. Your written exposure control plan. This is going to be the real key. Uh, incidentally, anytime in the OSHA standards that you see the term plan, that means the compliance officer is looking for ink on paper. Your plan will need to describe tasks that involve an exposure to respirable crystalline silica. The engineering controls work practices and respiratory protection that you're gonna use for each task. What housekeeping measures are you using to limit exposures? Procedures that you're using to restrict or access and when necessary to restrict access when necessary to limit exposures. Are you using tape? Are you using signage? Whatever you're going to do, you need to specify that in your exposure control plan. You remember we mentioned that you'll have a competent person. The OSHA standards already require a competent person for 23 different things. Well, guess what? This is number 24. Competent person, in case you missed this, has a legal definition. There's no card I can give you that makes you a competent person. There's no class you take that makes you a competent person. A competent person is defined by OSHA as an individual that is capable of identifying existing and foreseeable, in this case, respirable crystalline silica hazards, and who has authorization to take prompt corrective measures. If that worker has no authority, they are not a competent person. It's not uncommon for a compliance officer to ask, uh, who's your competent person here? That be him. So you're the competent person. Yep. What makes you a competent person? And Gordon is sitting there digging through his wallet looking for a card. And the answer is, I have had sufficient training and experience to recognize and identify these hazards, and I have the authority to stop work. I have the authority to remove employees from the area of hazard. I did not give him the employee. Uh, the authorization to go buy $25,000 worth of equipment, but he does have authorization to stop work. This is the same competent person that's required for excavations, for ladders, and 22 other things. The competent person should be making frequent and regular inspections of the job sites, materials, and equipment. What's he looking for? Well, if you've got control things like water spray, how about looking at that the water spray equipment is hooked up, it is getting water, and it is functioning. Documenting it is a really good idea. The medical surveillance, we said employers have to offer medical exams to workers who will be required to wear a respirator under the standard for 30 or more days a year. If what you're doing only requires you to wear a respirator once a month, that's not a requirement. Employers must offer exams every three years to workers who are exposed above the trigger level. And we talked about the requirements. By the way, chest x-rays for silica have to be read by somebody that can read an x-ray for silica, commonly called a B reader. This is not something that the average doctor does. There are only so many B readers in the state. You might have the x-rays taken at a local facility, 
they will need to be read by a B reader. The compliance dates, well, federal OSHA says employers are required to comply with all methods by 23 June, and then they push that back. And they say compliance with methods of sample analysis is required by June 23, 2018. And Virginia has said 23 June. They will delay until, what is our date now, September? Not in Virginia. Uh, in Virginia, it's, it's June 23. For planning inspections, right. September. For enforcement in Virginia, June 23. Yeah. If you've got an employee complaint, or if you've got a gross open apparent violation, there is no uh, time out on this. There are some things out there that can help you. First of all, there is some guidance and outreach. If you go to OSHA.gov silica, there are fact sheets, frequently asked questions. There is a video, there is Appendix B, which is medical surveillance guidelines, and they've got coming soon, maybe in there now, small entity compliance guides. There are also things that are being done through our own Virginia Department of Labor that you can use for training and for documentation of the training. The bottom line is, if you're not comfortable with where you are now, you need to start documenting what you're doing to identify your hazards, to train your workers, and get into compliance. You know, when the kids get a new toy, that's gonna to be the first thing that they play with. Make no mistake, this is the new toy. Do expect this to receive a lot of attention. It doesn't break my heart because I can tell you from personal experience that silicosis is a really crappy way to die. My dad had 40 years of breathing rock dust and I watched it take a very strong man and change him into somebody that didn't have enough wind to walk from the house to the mailbox. We don't need to do this to our people. And our goal should be at the end of the day, everybody gets to go home. Gordon, do we have some questions here? I believe we do. Uh, let me check on these here real quick. Um, uh, and if you do have questions, feel free to uh, uh, send them as, as they come along. Uh, so the first question I have here is, uh, when you mention an employee who wears a respirator less than 30 days, does that include wearing an N95 particle mask too? The N95 particulate mask is a respirator. And if they are wearing that respirator in order to meet the standard, not simply wearing it for creature comfort because it makes them feel better, but an N95 is a respirator, even though it's a disposable. Very good, thank you. Uh, next question is define days as it relates to 30 days per year. That's a really good question, and I am going to have to see what OSHA says on that, but I would take days as being a day. There is no specification that a day is eight hours. If I have someone that comes in and works 10 hours, I would consider that to be a day. Is VOSH going to shift adjust the VEL like they do for the lead standard? By shift adjust, if you're referring to the eight hour time weighted average, if your exposure is for greater than eight hours at a time, I would assume that they will do that. That's pretty much the standard industrial hygiene practice. However, I don't work for Vosch and I can't answer on their behalf. We'll also look into it and uh, provide some information on our website, the AGC website as well on that. How do you dispose of the silica dust after, after it's been captured by a dust extraction system? Well, I usually take it over into my competitor's backyard and shake it out. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, again, if it's not in the air, I can't breathe it. You need to be careful when you're disposing or handling any material. The greater the free fall through the air it has, the greater the opportunity for to come back as a respirable dust. You can bag it, put it in the trash. It's not 
hazardous waste in that regard. Uh, it's, it's not like you're uh, packing up isobutyl bad stuff. The same thing if you've got a brick saw or a block saw, you'll wind up with a certain amount of sludge that's in the tray that the water spray is captured. Take it out while it's still wet, bag it, dispose of it. Don't let it dry out and then go chip it out with an air hammer. Good point. Nothing was mentioned about drywall. Is there silica in drywall? I am so glad you brought that up. Drywall typically does not contain silica that I have seen. It's made out of gypsum. However, there is a product that drywallers get into that does have a lot of silica in it. That is drywall joint compound. Where you're going in doing sanding on drywall compound, you may have a whopping silica exposure. The key there is gonna be, go to the safety data sheet for the drywall compound and see what it says. Next question is, what if I do the tasks that are listed in table one? Good, I think most of us will be. Yeah. If you are doing those tasks and you're implementing the controls that are listed in table one, as I understand the standard, you have complied with the controls. You will still need the written exposure plan. But if you are implementing those controls, the regulators have said, bless you, my child, you have done the correct things. Good point. Next question. Small entity compliance guide says any required usage at all during the day counts as a day. And that would make sense. If I'm going to be sanding drywall, let's say for one hour out of the day, that's a day. If I do it for eight hours, it's a day. Yeah, thanks. Next one is, uh, join the conversation late, my apologies. What are the general contractor's responsibilities in controlling the subs and sub-tier subs on site? Very good question. And I would have to say no different than the responsibility that a GC has or anything that goes on on the job site. If this is something that you have control over, that you would reasonably be expected to be aware of, you do have a responsibility for that. And this is, comes back to the multi-employer. There's no difference in this and somebody that's on your job site using an extension cord that looks like it got run over by a lawnmower. Good point. Uh, next comment is uh, page 48, the Small Entity Compliance Guide says, if employees required to wear a respirator at any time during the day, that counts as one day of respirator use. Great, Makes appreciate sense. it. Yep. Uh, next one is, what if I do tasks that are not listed in table one? Ah, then you're doing stuff like we do. And that's going to be that you're going to need to find out what the exposures are for the things that you are doing. And you're actually going to need to take some measurements of what your employees' exposures are. This is something that you can uh, contact an industrial hygienist, uh, an environmental engineering company for some help, or you might wanna talk with your insurance carrier. Most insurance companies are willing to provide some assistance to you in determining what your exposures are. But there's only so many of them. Do understand that this is gonna be a popular subject, so don't wait until the last minute. Good point. Is there silica in gypsum board or DENS deck, and would it tell you in the SDS for these products what the PEL is? It will tell you if there is silica in there. And it should tell you what the PEL is, but depending upon the age of that safety data sheet, PEL may be a little bit old. And bear in mind that the PEL is for each hazardous material within that product. So the silica that's in, uh, whether Densdeck has it or not, I don't know. But if it's in there, it's gonna have the same PEL as silica that's in concrete or silica that's in brick, et cetera. Silica, silica as long as it's crystal and silicon. There you go. Uh, so is a rock or paver supplied for masonry or landscaping applications considered a hazardous material? And do the suppliers have to provide an SDS if required? If it contains a hazardous material. Uh, 
I do get safety data sheets right now for crushed granite that are supplied by the quarries here in the area. And they do list on there what the silica is. So if you request the SDS, yes, if it has a hazardous material and silica, we've agreed as a hazardous material. Yep. Good point. So next one, uh, if we see lots of issues with multiple contractors working in close quarters, if a con contractor determines that their employees will, will need to wear a respirator for table one or air sampling and implements for their employees, but are working in an area with employees of another company who, because they aren't directly performing the task, are not wearing respirators, how do you anticipate OSHA will enforce compliance? Well, the second contractor will be responsible for also providing respirators for their employees and taking on the full requirements of a respirator program. Again, I cannot speak on behalf of Bosch. I'll give you my take on it. If I am shoulder to shoulder and Steve is, uh, or Gordon here is doing sandblasting and he's wearing a sandblaster's hood and I'm standing next to him, I'm exposed. If I'm exposed, I am in violation. How do we do this? I don't really have a good answer for you, except it could be that there are times that when I'm doing this, I need to demarcate the area where these people are working and other folks keep some distance from there. The amount of distance does not have to be great. It's not immense. What am I doing for ventilation? Where's the plume of dust going? But would a uh, general be held responsible under that? I think they would be. Is there silica in gravel roofs when they're being removed? Good question, show me which gravel. And again, it's going to depend upon what you've got. What is the rock? If it's dolomitic limestone, probably not. If it's granite, yeah, probably is. Now the real question is, are you doing anything with that gravel to produce a respirable dust? That gravel's already washed pretty well. It's been out there on the roof for 20 years. Are you doing anything to crush it? Are you doing anything to release a respirable dust? Because the rock itself is pretty hard to inhale. I'm with an abatement firm for full asbestos physicals, including chest x-ray, but uh, 300 bucks. <laughs> Can you give me a call later on? I want to find out where you're getting your physicals. The price is going to vary depending upon what your medical provider has. The silica exam in and of itself is not going to be necessarily an additional $500. But do expect uh, that you are going to have some cost in there. When will those training materials be available? Don't know. Uh, it should be up uh, very shortly. Actually, I think if you go to their website, I got an email from uh, from uh, Jay Rithrow as we were talking. It says that a lot of the uh, information on, on uh, Vosh's website is up. So if you go to www.dolly.virginia, spelled out, dot gov, backslash Vosh, underline enforcement, backslash silica, underline standard, it should be right there. So it's www.dolly.virginia.gov backslash Bosch, underline enforcement, under, uh, backslash silica. My understanding is they're saying that they're gonna be updating that uh, over the next couple of days as well with additional information. So you'll probably want to go back to it in the next couple of days to see what's there. We'll also have a link up to that on the AGC website. Look in the front page, top left, uh, where you saw registration for this um, this webinar, and, and we'll have links available for you there. Also, let me provide, or at least add, that AGC America has a uh, separate website is, uh, dedicated for a lot of additional information on this topic. Uh, you will need your password in order to, to log into there to, to get access to that. If you don't have that, please uh, call or email our office, and we'll, we'll get you that, that information so that you can get logged in and uh, onto that website. Okay. Uh, Brandon Real asks, is the majority of the stone quarries in Eastern Virginia limestone? Virginia has a really varied geology and it's going to depend upon where you are in Eastern Virginia. 
the stone that's in Fredericksburg is significantly different from the stone here in Richmond. Uh, the stone in Fredericksburg might be basaltic trap rock, and what we're dealing with here is granite. The real key there is gonna be go to the quarry that's your supplier and ask them for the safety data sheet on their product. Next question is, how are the areas to be identified for silica dust hazard? You know, the standard doesn't specify that. It's, it's gotta be something that is going to work. Uh, if you're asking, what would I do? Let's say that I had a uh, concrete plant and I've got a silo or uh, a search pile area that I've got silica sand and I know I'm gonna have high silica levels in that area. I would probably have signage that says, uh, warning, silica, respirator required beyond this point, or something to that effect. Great point, great point. Uh, next question is, um, will booms be outlawed on construction sites for general cleanup? And is dust down a viable control method means? Okay, by dust down, I take it you're referring to a sweeping compound. Uh, most sweeping compounds will hold down on the dust that you're creating. What they were referring to specifically was dry sweeping. Yeah. Okay. And there's a note here. If someone next to you is wearing special PPE, you probably need to be wearing special PPE. Great yeah. point, great point. The general could be held responsible, as well as all subs, including prime sub who's generating silica dust. Bosch could go after all in the area. And David, I think you're right. It's the principle of the machine gun. If you put out enough bullets, you'll hit something. Uh, last question we have right now is, what is the compliance distinction again between 623 and 923 dates in Virginia? As I understand this, Virginia will not begin specifically targeting construction silica uh, inspections until 923. However, beginning on 623, if there is a complaint from a worker about an exposure to respirable crystal and silica, or a compliance officer is visiting your job site and looks over and there is Bubba running a handheld grinder, grinding concrete, and you can't really see Bubba because he's in a cloud of dust. Expect that the compliance officer will begin enforcement of the standard at that point. They're not gonna specifically target you, but if they're presented with a target of opportunity, they're gonna follow up on it. Absolutely, that's a great point. And uh, keep in mind that, you know, most of times if they're driving by a site uh, and they see something and something looks, looks rather suspicious and it may not necessarily be silica related, but something else, uh, they certainly have, have the, the right and, and will stop off and, and start checking things out and looking at it from that perspective. So be prepared is, is the best way to kind of describe that. Okay. Yep. And uh, to step back just a little, Don, you'd ask about brooms. Uh, brooms will probably not be outlawed, but I got a strong feeling that leaf blowers are not going to be allowed to use to clean up silica dust. Yeah, yeah, great point, great point. Okay, folks, uh, that looks like that's all the questions we have. Thank you all very much for this. We have recorded this, so uh, we'll have a link up on our website. If you wanna share this with any of your coworkers, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, if you have questions or additional comments, uh, at this point, uh, you know, or in the future, please feel free to, uh, to um, email Curtis or myself at AGC America, uh, just half of me anyway, and we'll be glad to provide that information for you. Have a great day. Thank you. Curtis, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks.